Jesus. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. Let's just stand this morning. <clears throat> Any prayer requests as we go to the Lord? And unspoken. unspoken, yes. <laughs> Matthew's friend, yes. Needs help. Okay. Let's all lift up our voice together. Heavenly Father, as we come before thee. And Lord, we want to say this morning, we're thankful, Lord, for thy only begotten Son that came and died on the cross of Calvary for each and every one of us. Lord, Heavenly Father, you know, Lord, all the thoughts of every soul that's on the planet. But Lord, you've seen the request that has gone before thee. And Lord, we're ever so thankful, Lord, that you are mindful, Lord, of your children that's requesting upon thee, Lord. I pray that you would meet these prayers this morning. Now, Lord, as also thy nation, Israel, Lord, in the time that we're living in, and Lord, we're ever so thankful that you have them in mind as well. Now we ask and commit this service in your hands in that wonderful name of the Lord Jesus Christ, I pray. Amen and amen. Praise the Lord. Be seated this morning. I'm going to ask Brother Paul to come lead us in the song service. the Lord. Good morning, everyone. So much to be thankful for. I'm just so thankful this morning. I was thinking about that on the way in, how the Lord has blessed us so, and, and uh, His great salvation, knowing the Lord. I'm just thankful this morning. I've been redeemed by the blood of the Lamb I've been redeemed by the blood of the blood of the blood of the Lamb. 
been redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. I've been redeemed by the blood of the Lamb, safe and sanctified I am. All my sins are under the blood. I've been But for the blood shed on Calvary Street, but for the blood, it'd be no hope for you. sets me free but for the blood thank you Lord shed on Calvary Street but for the blood there'd be no hope for you and me for all my righteousness and that's all I'd ever be but for the blood that cleanses and sets me free but for the blood shed on Calvary Street but for the blood no hope for you and me for all my righteousness is filthy rags and that's all I'd ever be but for the blood that cleansing sets me
sees me he sees the blood of the lamb he sees me
Anyone else have a song on your hearts this morning? 309 in the red. In the blue book, 309. Let's just love Jesus. Let's just love Jesus. That's why.
Thank you, Lord. Of the 
Christ is six closer than a brother. Yes, he is. Hallelujah. He's real. He's real. Thank you, Lord. He's a spirit that came to me when I didn't know him. Of course he brought information. Jesus had died for my sins. And I cried out in the spirit. Uh, waiting upon the Lord. It was earlier in the week. The Lord brought a situation that we had. It was kind of a challenging time in our lives, at least 25 years ago. And um, it's just been on my heart all week. I'm really impressed to, to talk about it again. And at the time, I remember just waiting upon the Lord, not knowing how things were going to work out for this particular thing, but in my heart, it wasn't is he going to do it? Is I wonder how he's going to do it. And one day, that answer came by the way of a phone call. And after that phone call, I sat down and just opened my Bible, and it opened up to Ephesians 3.20. That's where my eyes fell. And that scripture was, unto him that is able to do exceedingly abundantly, above all that we ask and think, according to the power that worketh in you. And I was thinking, if we didn't have those challenging times in our lives, that scripture wouldn't be real to me today. And it wasn't just a one-time deal, like, the Lord has blessed me with that scripture. I've been able to stand on that scripture for all those years. And then last night I was listening to a testimony, and she quoted that scripture. I, I thank the Lord for these challenging times, because that's how I learn, and that's how he's molding me. Yes. I love the Lord today. Praise Thank you. Joyce, did you have a song this morning? Jesus, Jesus, 
We're going to start with the corner. <laughs> Love grew where the blood fell. Flowers of hope sprang up for men in misery. And sin died where the blood fell, and I'm so glad His precious blood covers me. My Jesus. Precious blood covers 
Pretty happy, content. Okay, we'll turn the service over to uh, Brother Fred, if you would stand, please. Well, praise the Lord. Imagine what it'd be like when we get to heaven. But I'm thankful that, uh, not that I want to be here, I'd rather be in glory. But it's needful for you and I to be here so we can grow. Praise the Lord. Heavenly Father, as we come to this part of the service, I thank you, Lord, for your what you've done for us, and I thank you, Jesus, for going to Calvary. And Lord, what a wonderful Savior thou art. And, and Lord, all the things, Lord, that you have got for us, Lord. And now, Lord, as we will look into your word, just have your way, I pray, in that wonderful name of the Lord Jesus Christ, I ask this morning. Amen. Praise the Lord. You can be seated this morning. Want to turn with me this morning to the book of Revelation? In the first chapter of the book of Revelation, as John was taken up in the spirit to our day and even beyond our day, what he's seen when he went up to heaven, it was God's grace and mercy that he allowed him to show him some things that we would need in our hour and our day to understand how to walk with the Lord because without knowing some of the things that's pertaining for us and the book of Revelation is a love letter to the bride of Christ. He loves you. He loves each and every one of us because otherwise he would not have written it and the reason it was written is so that you and I would know how to walk in this world that's full of confusion and, and everything else but the right thing in the hour that we live in. And it helps us, keeps us on a straight and narrow way. If those things we didn't know about what the Lord would be doing in our hour, in time, we would be just like the denominational church. But I'm thankful that the spirit of revelation, the spirit of, of the Lord Jesus Christ, that comf or the comforter, which is the Spirit of God, really, that comes to you and I and shows us things that's pertinent for our hour because things are on ground that we can see it. And it makes it real. It's just not reading a, a page out of a history book. Yes, it was written in 96 AD, but today, you and I, although it was written back then, today it's coming off the pages and you and I can see a picture and with that picture, it gives you insight of where we're going and how far are we going till we get there. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. 
So in, in this book of Revelation, I'll start in verse 10. And I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day and heard behind me a great voice as of a trumpet. Now that trumpet is not Jesus Christ, that's God himself. God speaks like a trumpet. Saying, I am Alpha and Omega, the first and the last. What thou seest, write in a book and send it to the seven churches that are in Asia, unto Ephesus, unto Samaria, unto Pergamos, unto Thyatira, unto Sardis, and unto, unto Philadelphia, and unto, unto Laodicea, which is you and I in this hour that we live in. Now, if God was going to express something to the future that he was going to express to John that lived in 96 AD, he would have to use something in reference that his mind could capture. He could not, picture, he could not write something about what you don't know that don't exist. So he knew there were seven churches in Asia, but God picked them for a purpose, for a spirit that would be in each one. And we are in the last one, so praise the Lord. So as the Spirit of God is speaking to John, says, look, he says, write this in the book. Now, if God says to write it in the book, it's got to be important. I protest against the denomination says, that say that the book of Revelation should have never been written. The reason they say that, because they don't understand it. They don't understand it because they don't have the Spirit of God. And sometimes, knowing the spirit, having the Spirit of God, I know in the past, it was looked upon that if you had the Holy Ghost, lightning would flow through you, you'd be dancing, rolling on the floor, and that's all wonderful. But that has nothing to do with the new birth. The new birth is the Spirit of God coming within you and I, and just like Jesus told Nicodemus, just like the wind, you can't tell where it comes or goes. He didn't say you're going to jump up and down, you're going to speak in tongue, you're going to see lightning, you see this, that, and the other thing. But there'll be a change in the heart. The Spirit of God will start to take his word and open it up. Somewheres as we walk along with the Lord, there will be experiences. But we are not saying, well, Lord, you gave that to this one and this to the, the other one. Everybody's got to have the same. No. He gives you sufficient for you and I to be his child. Because if you weren't his child, you wouldn't be here this morning. You wouldn't, want, you wouldn't be hungry for truth. You, if you want a lazy type, feel good experience, join a denominational church. You'll find less is stressful for you unless you got one there bickering among one another. But that's another story. So now as we are living in this time frame, in Laodicea, and so John was told to write it. But then in verse 12 he says, And I turned to see the voice that spake with me. Now he went to look at the voice, it's worded that way, but there's no way that you can see the, a voice, can you? And he that is everywhere present, nowhere absent, you'll never see him anyway. But you can hear his voice. And so John heard that voice. Now from verse 13 to verse 16, he's going to show Jesus among the candlestick. How do you picture that? Is it a picture when, in the days of John? In 1963? The next few verses, if you really want to know, is a summary, a summary of the grace age of time, the church ages of time. It shows it actually in its completed form. Not while it's 
putting through, because if you look at the, well, sometimes I put a picture about, well, I don't know if I have one here, but. Well, you all know what I mean, <laughs> so to speak. Uh. Okay, I'll use this one. That's a picture that we got in our mind, right? And we see that, and oh, it's a beautiful picture. Jesus in the midst of the seven candlesticks. But nowhere do we ever look at it. What is it really portraying to you and I? It's, now here, it is not an accurate, an accurate picture of what the scripture's saying. It is accurate to a certain point. But we're going to see some of the descriptions as John is told now to write this. And we're going to show that it is a summary when the grace age is completed because it's showing you a complete picture. So what completes the picture for the bride? When the Lord comes for her and she goes to glory. Right? The bride is completed at the rapture. Especially completed being at the wedding supper there. She's going to be his wife. All right. Now when John was going to write, Bear with me, I'll just. As we're going to read this, he says, And in the midst of the seven candlestick, one like unto the Son of Man. It didn't say he was the Son of Man was like unto. That should ring the bell saying, this is a vision. Right? And one like unto the Son of Man, it's an angelic being that's showing this vision to John. It's not the actual literal Lord Jesus Christ. It's a vision of him, but it's a vision showing the Lord here emits, emits amongst the, in a vision form, amongst the seven golden candlesticks. And a man clothed with a garment down to the foot, girded about the paps with a golden girdle. We read those words. My, that's nice. He's got a, he's got a robe. He's got a girdle. Now, a girdle, it means a belt. The paps is not the waist. It's the shoulder area. Right? And if we look in the Old Testament for types, and you'll find it in Exodus chapter 28, around verse 28, the whole chapter 28 expresses what a high priest should be dressed like. All right? Now, we can only take so much of the Old Testament priesthood of how he was dressed to being attributed to Jesus Christ. There's things type certain areas of his dress mode. But I want you to bear in mind as while I'm saying that, remember, Jesus was not of the tribe of the Levite. He's after the order of Melchizedek, isn't he? But yet, of a Melchizedek, Moses was told how the priest, as a type of Christ as well, was to be dressed like. In the Old Testament priest, he had a robe that was blue. That's the robe. 
Now, if I say the word epod, yeah, here it's a name, it's a word, it's something. What does it mean? It's an overgarment. It's this multicolored that's going over his robe is called the epod. You all knew that, right? Good. Praise the Lord, you read your Bible. All right. And on him he had a breastplate with the 12 stones representing the 12 tribes of Israel. And those in time, God would use that for judgment because depending what was right or wrong, the stones would light up or not light up concerning a judgment being made. And that was done by the high priest, God using the high priest. But when it goes into the description of, a, of the high priest, on that breastplate, It tells you in Ezekiel 28, 28, that the girdle was underneath lower than the breastplate that he had. So the high priest's garment, his uh, belt, if you want to, or the, the curious girdle, they call it, or the, tie, the rope that was tied, was at the waist level, which signifies a priest's office. But a girdle tied to the breast without the breastplate because Jesus didn't need no breastplate. How many of you know that? He's not judging the 12 tribe of Israel. He's judging the bride or those that would come to salvation. And so therefore when we see him, it says he has the breastplate around, the, he has that girdle around the breast or the shoulders. That's a judge function. So when we're looking at this here, the church age is over. It's a summary of the completeness of it. He's there as judge as well, portraying. That's part of the, of the picture that he's portraying. Now remember, it's portraying the age too. But it's also portraying him as being judge. So he's going to be judged before he's going to be king and he had I'm going to read a little further and his head and his hair were white as wool Jesus didn't have gray hair and when Paul when he was knocked off his horse uh, fell to the ground sorry when he seen that vision most of the time, you don't see Jesus with gray hair. But that's to signify the great eternal spirit that is involved in this picture. And the gray hair is not there to show age. It's to show wisdom. It goes along with the, the girdle being around the, the shoulder because a judge in the old, uh, well, not so much nowadays, they, would, they do have, they did have an attire, and they put on an old white wig to present wisdom. If they wanted to present old age, they didn't have to wear the, the wig. Most judges would have pretty well white hair. All right? So it was, these things are symbolic. All right. And he had his, and his, his hair were as white as wool, as snow, and his eyes was a flame of fire. Why was his eyes a flame of fire? You don't find the flame of fire or the white hair and none of those things when Jesus took his three disciples on Mount Transfiguration. There he's seen Bright as the sun. He was so bright, they couldn't distinguish his features. And when we see Jesus, I don't mean to make it sound funny, but when we're at the wedding supper, Are we going to marry an old man? 
when Jesus rose from the dead when he walked on the shores of Galilee after his resurrection, or he on, uh, met the disciples on the road to Emmaus, did he have gray hair? It don't mention that whatsoever. Now they said they didn't recognize him. Yes, their vision can be withholding, that they could see it as well. But remember, according to what Job said, in the resurrection, we come to the days of our youth. He would have been no longer being represented as 33 years old. He would have been to his days of his youth. Now, you don't get so much wrinkles and that stuff like that in, in 15 years, right? Don't go there. Okay. But I'm just saying that's part one part of it. But what did remain for Jesus that God had, and he would have that through eternity, is a nail scar in his hands and the pure side. That will always remain. It's there to show you and I who Jesus is. Now, his eye was as a flame of fire. Does that flame of fire, is it expressed during the grace age? Do we have scripture for that? Well, I don't know about during the grace age. But in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, when we appear before the Lord, have I got those here or did I put them up? Oh. I thought I had it here. If any man build upon this foundation, gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, and stubble. Yes, we all read it. We all know it. We, we got it down pat. Praise the Lord. Every man's work shall be made manifested, for the day shall declare it. What day? The day that we're going to stand before the judgment seat of Christ. When is that? Before the church age is completed? No. When the church age is completed. Uh, the, the, sorry, the Gentile time, well, the church age as well. Because it shall be revealed by fire. So the fire in his eyes that we see in Revelation chapter 1 is just there to portray, not that there's going to be actual fire shooting out of his eyes, but it would be like him looking into your soul and burning everything that don't belong there on that judgment day. That goes hand in hand with being, him being a judge, having the gird around his shoulders, the white hairs, all these things presenting him as judge. He's been high priest all through the grace age, but this is showing the summary or the end of the whole picture. And it ends with him being judged. He's not judged through the whole grace age. Now, Someone said, well, he judged our sin. He did that at Calvary. Judgment must begin before the house of God. That has nothing to do with the ju him being judged concerning that day of judgment that we stand before him. That means correction for the church. And when Jesus died on Calvary, when he died for your and my sin, it was complete. Salvation was purchased, right? And if we believed in the finished work, what he did for you and I at Calvary, God sees you clean, even though there's a lot of work to be done in you. Don't look at your and my righteousness being, well, I've got this to correct and that to correct. No, it's his righteousness. He knows that. He knows that better than you and I do. Sometimes we forget that. We, well, Lord, clean this and clean that. But he says, he could, if he could speak this morning to you right here, he'd say, now wait a minute. It's my righteousness, not yours. 
Yes, the life of a child of God will want to clean those things. It will cause him to remove those things. But don't you think God knows that? So are you righteous or maybe so, so righteous because depending what you've done this week? It's what he's done. It's done. It's finished. Now how we walk and what we do will determine whether we're bride material or white robe material. Right? So again... Are you righteous? Not by your feelings. By faith means by revelation. Means if you have that revelation, Jesus is your righteousness. Period. End of story. Don't try to elaborate it, to stretch it out here and there. It's done. You're free. But you're not free to do whatever you want. Because if he's done that for you, then the Spirit of God will cause you to grow into what your Heavenly Father has seen you to be. Now I'm getting off the message. But it's all right. I'm thankful that it's there. (laughs) And sometimes if you get plagued by... Satan bombarding your mind while you're not good enough or you didn't do this right and you fell here. And Satan, get thee behind me. I know I fail. But he didn't fail. And it's not my righteousness that you have to look at, Satan. It's he afforded his righteousness for me. And once we get that settled in our hearts, you're on the road to living a more victorious life. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Yes, praise the Lord. He's worthy to be praised. It's the Father's plan. Not the Son was obedient to it. And we have to be obedient to the Father's plan that He is our righteousness. Praise God. Now getting back to Revelation chapter 1. And every man's word shall be man- manifested that they shall declare it because it shall be revealed by fire and fire shall try every man's work. So how is the work going to be tried? I come before the Lord and have a, somehow, somehow some sort of mountain thing, some sort of figure thing. So I say, okay, I'll put it on there. And well, Is this going to burn? No, that has nothing to do with it. He... The Father has given the Son to do all judgments. And the Spirit of the Father can see right through you and I, and you and I will have no excuse before him on that day. You may try, well, Lord, I think I got a headache. Well, Lord, you didn't know how the trials I was going through. That won't fly. And whatever he looks through in you and I, It'll have a killing effect of the things that wasn't, that's not needful there, that's going to be taken away, that where you and I can be in the millennium with him. Wow. So this picture that we see here, this summary, that's why he's got eyes like fire. It's when we stand, the day we stand before him, he can pierce and burn everything that is not necessary. But if everything burns and we have no reward, we end up with white robes, not bride. Okay? Because if there's no reward, the, the purpose of ruling and reigning with Jesus Christ is to have rewards. Now, it's not the race to get as many rewards as you can. Yes, that comes with living the life. But if I played around here on earth, be nonchalant, whether you're in the ministry or whether you're a believer. A a lazy, disical, or however they express it, lifestyle, that's going to burn. 
but the things that he brought. Those talents, those gifts, those revelations he's given you. Now I want to bring this part in. When it talks about in the parables of Matthew 25 and 19 and Luke chapter 19 and, and other parables, it talks about the re, having received a talent or a pound and we are to increase in those things. It's the Lord that gives it to begin with. But if I am of the attitude, because I don't like a certain servant, or I didn't like the way it was expressed, I'm going to put it on the shelf. I was watching the news this week. That's kind of sort of triggered that. Amazon is building our gigantic stores with all kinds of shelves. Right? And things are just put on the shelves. For you and I, Christian, yes, something you don't understand is one thing to put some things on the shelf. But if everything in this hour you're living in is on the shelf, and the Lord comes, He's going to look at you and me and says, what are all those shelves you've got over there? Couldn't you see truth when it comes in your day? Not of the past, the fresh meat. Yes, there's things that comes our way that's to be thrown away, false doctrines and such like. But surely in the hour, in those last 14 years, there's got to be some meat somewhere that came. If we take that meat and put it on the shelf, well, the day's going to come is if you leave it on the shelf long enough. The Lord will come. And he says, well, how come you put my word on the shelf? Now, some will use that excuse. I go back to the days when the church started. When Peter preached... And there was 3,000 souls, 3,000, 5,000 per time. Anyway, did they say, oh, I'm going to put it on the shelf? Wait how this is going to fare out? Because I'm not sure about this guy, Peter. Later on, there was 5,000, then there was 3,000 more. Did those people say, I'm going to put that on the shelf? The Holy Spirit, if you have the Holy Spirit, in the day truth comes, that's when that genuine child of God sees it. He don't put truth in his day and put those things on the shelf. Because putting on the shelf shows something wrong. There's an attitude problem sometimes. A prejudging, looking at things, and will cause them to put them on the shelf. That's why the brand of movement, when Brother Jackson was, when the Lord used Brother Jackson, everything he said, those that maybe want to look at it, now there's some that didn't want to even want to look, they put everything on the shelf. And they're still on the shelf. And they will be still on the shelf when Jesus comes. And when they come before him and his eyes of fire sees it, that's going to burn. Your shelf is going to burn. Granted, not everyone sees certain depths of, of things that are more complex than the Word of God takes time. But just to say, I'm going to put it on the shelf and I'll wait, I don't know, maybe next year or whenever the time comes, I don't care. Just put it on the shelf and we'll just leave it there. And then they, they put it there and forget. Now, men, you've had, well, I shouldn't put it that way. That's wrong. When your husband, women, puts things on the shelf and he forgets where he put it. Or, why, or men, your wife puts something on the shelf and you don't know where it is and she forgot where she put it. 
Well, that should, okay, I'll go one step further. That shows you're getting old. Well, I've got to gentle it down a little bit. But there comes a time it needs to be taken off of there. If it's truth. Because if we put shelf on, truth on the shelf too long, you'll never pick it up. And there could be a reason why it's not picked up. Okay, I'll go on from there. So his eyes like a flame of fire. And his feet unto fine brass. Now the reason his feet is fine brass, brass in the Bible in the Old Testament represents judgment. He judged our sins at Calvary. But in the book of Revelation, in chapter 10, now in another vision as that angel comes down to the earth, it says his feet was like a flaming fire. Why? What does he want to burn? In Revelation chapter 10. It's because his feet that's on fire touches the land and the sea. The flame of fire of his feet speaks of the judgment of the Quick, that's going to be in that half hour silence. The eyes of uh, flame of fire that we see in chapter 1 is mainly for those that would be in heaven when this year has come to completion. This is all happening at the same time frame or the half hour time frame if you want to. Not the half hour silence itself which is only a short period of time. But within that half hour silence there's a whole lot of things that are taking place. A lot of people have put a lot of things on their shelves. How can you tell? Just listen to what they minister. It's very plain and simple. So now his feet is as flame of fire. He's going to burn something with his feet. It's showing he's touching the earth. His feet does not touch heaven. Well, I hope we're enjoying this a bit. Getting your eyes opened up some. We can't always stay in Brother Jackson's message. Wonderful as it is. And when we need to be reminded about basic salvation. To count and look where we came from. We can't always be in the book of Revelation either. But somewhere if we're only there and we're not here. That identifies something right away. But I'm thankful that the Lord has truth even in the day that we live in. How long did it take for the church at Ephesus to come to perfection for their age? A hundred years? Paul preached there over two years, almost three years, of everything that was needed to be instilled with them. And I would say seven or eight years following that, from that light that was lit from Ephesus, lit all the other churches. It didn't take them 54 years to come to completion. Now, they were perfect for their hour. Let's put it that way. The doctrines of Jesus Christ and of the apostle has been restored for 54 years. And that's a work that needs to be done for new Christians. And needs to be ministered from time to time for those that are seasoned. But I have to say, 
just that alone, you will not be made perfect. Now, when you say perfect, oh, cleaning all the inner man, that has nothing to do with it. You are perfect before the Lord because what Jesus did to Calvary, it's his righteousness, remember? He sees you clean. But the robe of righteousness that the bride puts on. What is that robe? The principal doctrines of Jesus Christ or the doctrines of the apostles? No, it's every revelation. And if we don't see our hour that we're living in, we're not going into the rapture with a miniskirt. And you know what I mean by that? The dress is not full, full length, not full attire. I don't care how much you want to preach holiness, which is good. Well, I believe in Jesus. Well, you hear that from every denomination, every preacher that preaches any message. I know the word, I, I'm standing on the word of God. Well, that's not dressing them. That's starting them. That's starting you and I. Have you been started? Am I pre preaching to novice this morning? Now, if you all came here and you were just new, I wouldn't even attempt preaching this message. I'd point to you to Calvary, to Jesus Christ. And like Paul, when he says in Hebrew chapter 6, there was a church that just wanted to stay there. He says, it's good that you've had those things, but you must move on to perfection, to completion. There's more to the word of God than just having the inner man knowing that he's saved. Yes, knowing the inner man he's saved, you may be a good white robe. But it doesn't make you a bride. Well... All right, let's go on a little further. So his, his eyes was a flame of fire, his feet was as brass, as if it burned in a furnace, and his voice as the sound of many waters. And he had in his hand seven stars, and out of his mouth went a two sharp edged sword, and his countenance was as the sun shineth in his strength. So he showed him in his glorified state. Now remember, this is a vision. And the vision is to portray something to you and I. So when I see verse 13 down to verse 17 or 16, it shows it is a complete picture. It's a summary of the completion. I can't stress that enough. That's why the wool hair. That's why the sash is about his shoulder, not about the waist. came across something that I had seen a, a while back. Now, some like to portray that angel of Revelation chapter 10 as being the literal Lord Jesus Christ. That shows someone that still is, has not come up to date, that's still in the Branham era of time. And you heard it many times out in Hebrew chapter 2, verse 16, that Jesus never took on the natures of angels. Well, here's something else for you to ponder. Every one that is going to be of the human family is born. And every one of the angelic family is never born, they're created. There's a major difference between the two. Angels don't have babies. Angels don't get born. They are created. But the family of man, we're born of a natural birth, and we're born of a spiritual birth. Praise the Lord. That's what makes us, diff us different from the angelic beings. That didn't cost you much. 
Simple little thing sometimes clears a whole issue. Oh, but it is Jesus in the form of an angel. What do you mean by it? Are you trying to hide behind the scene and present that's Christ himself? It is Christ directing the words for that angel to speak. Yes. But he is not the angel itself. Because then you fall into trouble when we go to the wedding supper, that angel of Revelation chapter 10 does not go to glory. He goes to the Jews and the wicked Daniel. So where does that put your revelation? Nowhere. All right. have that here. Maybe I did or maybe I don't. Find out in a minute. No, I don't have it here, but anyway. Now, Jesus was a priest, not after the Levite. So that's why he don't need that breastplate with all the, the stones to do that with. That was a type, because remember, the 12 stones was for judging the 12 tribes of Israel. But the robe, the function, what is the function of a high priest? What's his purpose? I don't know. Intercede. For who? For the people to God, right? That's the function of a high priest. He's to do service. Not to himself, but for God on your and my behalf. That's what Jesus is doing. Now, I know there's been much controversy because there's just remnant of the days of Brother Branham. Melchizedek. Let's turn there in Genesis chapter 14 for a moment. I know some won't get up an arm. Well, said, well, I'd rather believe what Brother Branham said. I'd rather believe what Brother Jackson says. I'd rather believe what the Word says. It is above Branham and Jackson. And you're down to verse 18. Here's Melchizedek, the king of Salem. Now, in case you don't know, because knowing a bit of geography helps. Where Abraham was at and where Salem was, was only 20 kilometers. But from here to Shidak. Abraham knew of some kings much further away than that. Even up into the Babylonian Empire, or what would be the Babylonian Empire. Yet he didn't seem to know this one. You would have thought Abraham would have mentioned Melchizedek long before as he came into the promised land. But he's new, he's new to them. He's gone to war and he's went beyond 20 miles. He went some hundreds or 200 miles or more to capture Lot and take him out of those kings that took Lot. So he knew the way, he knew what was around in his geographical area. Now, surely he should have known who was still just 20 miles away. I'm just setting a picture. So here we have Melchizedek now. And Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought forth bread and wine. And he was the priest. Now, I'd, maybe not the best one to understand English. But when he says, of the most high God, that means he's of somebody. 
He is not that somebody. And if we say, well, he is God in theophany form, then I'd have to say with your revelation, then it says in verse 19, and he blessed him and said, blessed be Abraham of the most high God. Was Abraham in theophany form? Huh? You can't use one for one statement and one for the other. Well, that's neither here nor there, but here's the whole picture. And he blessed him, and as he blessed Abraham, he blessed Abram of the most high God, possessor of heaven and earth. And here's Melchizedek now. This is Melchizedek. He blessed the most high God. Does God bless himself? What planet do you live on? And if Melchizedek is a high priest, He's to do service, and here he is doing service to the most high God. As that should be fairly clear. Yes, before in the days of Brother Branham, before God had cleared up the revelation of the Godhead and how angels plays part in, <coughs> the, in our salvation, he had every right to say it that way. Praise God. But we're not living in that hour. We're living in this hour today. Now the burning bush. When Moses went up on the mountain and saw the burning bush, was that God? Or was that an angel that was projecting that? Well, I don't know. Is there something? Well, Paul says in Acts chapter 7, verse 30 and 35, he says it was an angel of the Lord. And the angel of the Lord spoke for the, in the first person of God to Abraham. Did not the same God when they were going towards the wilderness, when God was bringing them out of, the, the, out of Egypt, he says, I send my angel before you, you better obey his word, because why? It's God's word, speaking through it. Because he will not pardon, and so forth. So that all falls in, to me, a beautiful picture in this hour. We can't go hanging on to the past, and that revelation don't fit no more. We're living in this hour. It's the same that we talk about in the Revelation chapter 1. It's a summary of the whole thing. That's why, why did God take the purpose to have that angel show that vision to John with the wool hair, with the flaming eyes, and so forth. And the pap around, around the breast, or the, the belt around the breast. He was portraying at a judge. Now, well, brother, is that something new? No, brother Branham spoke that years ago. Somehow things get twisted and no, it's not that. Now you'll have those that go searching on the internet and they'll find some people's comment saying, well, sometimes the high priest wore it up there. Excuse me? The high priest? Because he was doing a, a, func- a high function. Well, let's look at it. He had to wear this. Doesn't, care, doesn't matter whether he was doing the average Sabbath or intervening once a year for the, whole, for the whole nation. He still had to wear that plus the sash around the waist. It says the This curious girdle was below the breastplate, which is the plate that had the the stones. Unless he has those stones above his head somewhere, and then he could put it here. That's only conjecture. Well, they say Josephus said that. That's not what Moses said. That's not what God said. Tell Moses. The high priest is to be dressed this way. It's a set of type. 
Because when you put the high priest of having the belt around the waist and around the shoulder, you're destroying the type that God was setting forth in Exodus chapter 28. Is that clear? I thank God for the move of spirit. Now thank God what has he opened up in this hour. And this picture here about the judgment seat of Christ the majority of the movement has put that on the shelf. Either they don't believe it, don't want it, or don't like the things the way it was expressed. But I don't care. I'm moving on. What is truth in the picture that's a clear, concise picture that Scripture can uphold Brothers and sisters, when the time comes that we do appear before the judgment seat of the Lord Jesus Christ, if we had taken some of his truth and put it on the shelf, and we don't care to look, we don't even care to bother with it, then I have to say, your shelves are going to burn. Now, God only holds us responsible for what he has given us. And if somebody's new that has come in and not been brought into all the things that God brought this hour, that's fine. I'm, the Lord knows that. But if we're talking to seasoned people, supposed to be seasoned, that's supposed to be bride, that's supposed to be dressed for revelation. They have hindsight, no foresight. Because whatever is foresight, they put on the shelf. Well, I shouldn't, well. Well, you say you should preach it in a nicer way. Well, how else do you want it to be a cross? How many times you heard Brother Brandon when he was coming down that tongues is not an evidence? That woman should not have short hair. No, I'm not going to preach on that. Or Brother Jackson, he was always upbraiding, sending things to try to get the Brandon movement to see the truth of his hour. But they were putting things on the shelf or they didn't want to care about it. No. He's, because they didn't like the way he was expressing things. They didn't like the way he, he, he was like a crank. Just... A, all the time we're coming down on the people. So we're like, no, he wasn't. There's times he preached wonderful messages too. But often when you hear some of his messages, was he targeting? He's, he's putting out what he believed. If you're not sure, then you can say, well, I, I believe this is this. No, you... You gotta, if you're going to be ministering, you've got to be convinced what you believe. And God looks at those that would want to hide behind Brother Jackson's message. He don't want you to hide there. You're under tutorship there. What are you doing today? What are we doing today? That's why I'm so often in, in this book of Revelation... Or the things that for this hour, they are just as needful to be part of that white robe that the bride is to wear. Can you still say amen? Praise the Lord. Now, if she says, Brother Fred, you're full of bananas, hey, I don't mind retiring. I can be at home just enjoying the Lord. But there's a... There is a people 
Those that are, don't want it, God's raising up a people, whether you realize it or not, that are seeing this, what we're ministering here. And they're all enthused about it. And they're building no shelves. I think Amazon and Walmart will run out of shelves pretty soon. Because when everything's on the shelf, then that a sign you have just stopped. And you can't go any further. But God wants you to go further. Yes, in the mix of all these things that are taking place at the hour we live in, yes, there are souls that rise up that will preach anything and everything. But somewhere, if you have the Holy Ghost, it should distinguish what's truth and what is not. And as everything is not, then God's not speaking anymore. He's only getting ready with all, we got all the tools now with what Brother Bradham brought and Brother Jackson brought. And by the way, when we go say, well, we're waiting for the rapture, we know about the miracle war and the, the building of the temple and the Ezekiel war. That was ministered 20 years ago. It's the same like Brother, Jack, Brother Branham when he talked about the seventh seal to those that were in the Brother Jackson's time. That's been a while back, but Brother Jack, Lord used Brother Jackson to bring it more up to date. And he didn't wait 20 years to do it. I marvel that we all say we have the Holy Ghost, and I can see it in action in the book of Acts, when Peter preached that sermon and so many souls were saved, they didn't all say, well, now we've got to put this on the shelf, see how this works out. Then later on, he preached again, and another group was saved. They're putting on the shelf, it's an excuse I don't want to know. Don't bother me. Don't trouble me. I'll look at it when the time comes. Praise the Lord. It shows a lack of hunger. If something's brought forth, it is our duty bound to go to the Lord in the scripture to see if it is thus so. It's not, wait, well, well, everybody gets to see it when everything's okay. Now I'll accept it because I will have a look at it. I'd have to say that person is not walking in the way the Lord wants them to walk. Oh, Fred, you're sounding off again. Well, what else can you do? If I didn't care, I'd turn that thing off. And I wouldn't even preach it here. I'd keep it to myself. And a lot of people would go Start, you see the crowd start dissipating over time. If God was allowed this to go on another 20, 30 years, 30 years, not that, they, um, that, it, that is so, but if it was, and you have no more truth, you're going to be no better than the denominations or the Brandon movement. All this that keeps them is to preach, preach something exciting to keep the people interested in. Preaching something to keep people interested is one thing. But truth won't keep you. I mean, exciting things won't keep you, but truth will. Praise the Lord. Are we sitting in heavenly places? It's not mine. It's whatever the Lord gives. It's his revelation. No preacher can claim, oh, this is my revelation. That, the warning bell should go off there now. But somewhere, if the spirit of, 
And plus the anointing and the Spirit of God should be there with it too. Praise the Lord. Maybe next Sunday, a good salvational message. You're due for it, right? Now, I'm thankful for what the Lord has done, and I thank God for this moving of the Spirit here this morning. Truly, the Lord is, has blessed us. But like Brother Haim says, the best is yet to come. If you never dance in the spirit, not that everybody has to dance in the spirit, or spoken in tongues or whatever the case may be, there's an anointing and a coming when this bride comes to her completion. She's going to have all those gifts operating within her. Not as a braggadocious to do it, but God's going to lift her up in a realm. Along with the truth. That she'll know where she stands and she'll have a message for the world. When the time God brings, uses her to bring a message, the world won't accept it. But what's going to make her shine like the stars of heaven? When God moves in that bride like he did in Jesus Christ, like he will be doing in those two prophets in the week of Daniel, the world don't care if you believe in Christ. They don't care if you speak in tongues or if you do a Jericho or, or, or how much you love the Lord. But when God uses someone to speak, this is going to happen. And it transpires as God gave that vessel to speak it. Then the world will take note. Won't make believers out of them, but they will take note. So praise the Lord. That's the hour we're moving to. The reason that we are being tried and tested, so when the time comes that we don't start using these gifts for our own personal use. Well, my mother, you know, or, or my aunt is sick. Lord, I'm going to just, no. If he's, we pray for them. But if God shows, then you can say, thus saith the Lord. And their gift will work perfectly as it did in the beginning. And that builds up faith, doesn't it? Pray for our loved ones. Yes, we should have a concern for souls. But it's not our concern that puts them in the bride of Jesus Christ or white robes. It is not your my choice. It's God's choice. He's seen the choice for the foundation of the world. Hey, he's seen you for the foundation of the world. Praise the Lord. Oh, the, the beauty of it all, well, when we get over there, what a wonderful day that'll be. And I've maybe said enough for this morning. Let's just stand, Heavenly Father. I thank you, Lord, for... A place, Lord, that we can speak, Lord, freely. I thank you, Lord, for my brothers and sisters. Lord, use the message that you receive fit this morning. In that wonderful name of the Lord Jesus Christ, I pray. Amen and amen. Praise the Lord. You can be seated. Have your decision come in case someone still has a need. Amen. Praise the Lord for a wonderful time this morning. <laughs> There's a heaven to gain. 
and a hell to shine. The way you still stray. There's a race to be won. You can live as you please, but you must pay. the highway to heaven still goes by the cross there's a heaven to gain and a hell to shine there's a race to be won you can live as you please, but you must pay the cost, and the highway to heaven still goes by the cross. There's a heaven to gain, and a hell to shine. still stray there's a race to be won you can live as you please but you must pay the call and the highway to heaven still goes by the cross don't just read our Bible just on Sunday. There's so much in God's word, praise the Lord. Well, that depends on your hunger, too, so amen. Let's just stand at this time. Brother Michael, if you would dismiss in a word of prayer this morning. Yes, Lord. 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 Yes,
you all thank you and praise you. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. In Jesus' precious name, I ask you to Amen. 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 Amen